We're live for real this time, everybody. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for coming in. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see the chat building up. Thank you for waiting. You were very patient with us. It's very, very nice. Thank you to whatever Book Passage employees on my account for writing in the chat. I appreciate you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so everybody, my name is Nicholas Mitchell. It's nice to see you all here today. Uh, welcome to another episode of Book Passage Live. Uh, we here at the bookstore are very excited to bring to you some of the best conversations and authors that you can find out there on the internet. If you've never, if you have seen these events before, you're a returner to one of these things. Welcome back. We're glad to have you. Thanks for being here. I hope to see you in ones going forward. But if you're new here, Book Passage is an independently run bookstore out of the San Francisco Bay Area. We have a store in the San Francisco Ferry Building and our main store up in Corte Madera. And back when crowds weren't quite so dangerous, we hosted book talks just like these at our bookstores very, very often. Uh, as we are now streaming on YouTube, and I think we'll continue to do so in some capacity in the future, please consider subscribing to the YouTube channel. We host events like these almost every day, <laughs> um, and if you would like to be a part of that, uh, if you'd like to know whenever we do go live, uh, clicking the subscribe button is very, very useful, not only for letting us know that you enjoy conversations like these, but also for letting you know whenever it is we go live. If indeed you would like to know every time we go live, you can click the notification bell just next to the subscriber button, uh, and YouTube will actually send something to your phone or to whatever it is you use uh, YouTube on. Uh, if you'd like to check out tonight's book, uh, As a Woman, or any of the other books that are mentioned here tonight, uh, just a hint, our moderator also has a book, uh, you can find it all at bookpassage.com. Uh, I'll be sure to put a link in the chat in a minute. If you'd like to know about our upcoming events, you can go to bookpassage.com slash event, uh, which will bring you to a calendar where you can look at anything that's upcoming. You can pick and choose which ones you want to go to. We have some ticketed events that you need to know about ahead of time. Uh, and that would be where you would find that. Finally, if you have any questions for tonight's speakers, you should put them in the YouTube chat. Uh, if you write your questions in there, I will see them, and I'll pass them over to our speakers. Uh, and although they don't always get to them, and not all of them are on topic, uh, we do appreciate you asking them. And we appreciate any praise that you have for the authors, for the speakers, and particularly for their book. Uh, thank you very much for writing in there. Now, on to our authors. Uh, first off, we have our author today, Dr. Paula Stone-Williams, who is the author of our book today, As a Woman. Uh, she's an internationally known speaker on gender equity, LGBTQ advocacy, and religious tolerance. She's also a pastor and pastoral counselor in Boulder, Cal Boulder County, Colorado. Paula has been featured in the New York Times, TED Women, TED Summit, TED Mile High, Red Table Talk, the Denver Post, the New York Post, New Science Magazine, and uh, Radio New Zealand, which is very interesting, uh, among many, 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 many other media outlets. Her TED Talks have had more than 5 million views when uh, we found out that we were hosting her. Uh, uh, several people from uh, Book Passage and in the author stables were um, passing around all the TED Talks to the people that hadn't seen them yet. Uh, it was actually very fun. Uh, good times. Uh, in conversation tonight, we have Kathy Rath, um, who was born and raised in New York and completed her education at UCSB and SFSU, where she is now a professor in the public health department. For the past 11 years, she has taught women's health to undergraduate students and a cohort of graduate students from SFSU's post-baccalaureate health promotions program. Kathy added community building in community health to her course repertoire in 2015. A writing coach and tutor from middle school to the graduate school level, Kathy also uh, guides debut writers in crafting and completing their books. Her first published novel, Ripple Effect, came out in January 2021, which is also available from bookpassage.com. Everyone, I'm so excited for tonight's conversation. It should be absolutely excellent, but let me get out of the way and pass the show off to our speakers tonight. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. All right. Welcome, Paula. Oh, I am so, this is the first time uh, since the pandemic that I am returning to the uh, author event platform and I'm doing an in conversation with you and this is thrilling. Uh, again, uh, thank you for choosing Book Passage as one of your launching pads for As a Woman, what I learned about power, sex, and the patriarchy after I transitioned. Love that second. We'll get to that one. Um, and as uh, Nick was saying, I am assuming that the people who are on 
line right now, a part of the millions who have seen you already and um, the TED Talks. And also, if people didn't know that you were also at the 59th presidential inaugural prayer ceremony. Kudos. It was, that was just great to see, too. And while those pieces and the videos, this extraordinary journey has been coming to light over the past year or two, it's your memoir here that really um, takes readers into the depths of the torment and the tears, and ultimately uh, the courage to make your transition from Paul to Paula. And uh, by the end, I have to say, the intimacy you established wanted me to reach out and give you a hug, you know, of gratitude for making your story so accessible, so relatable, and really so valuable for the LGBTQI you know, population and community in specific, but the public in general. So thank you. Thank you, I've Kathy. prepared some questions. And I just want to also start out with, um, you know, it's the question people always ask, like, uh, you know, writing this book, uh, like how, wow, it's like the heroine's journey. You call it the hero drag or the heroine's journey here. And uh, it was beautifully told, uh, you know, I, you don't think of memoirs as page turners, but this was a page turner. And, uh, you know, it's inspiring, the quotes, the studies, you learn so much about so many different topics in there. Again, uh, what was really amazing is the honesty jumping off the pages and condensing your life into 239 pages. It's very hard. So um, what did it feel like to do this? Uh, what was your process? When, it was, when did you decide? It was not an easy process. I had no idea that once I transitioned, I would end up having such a huge platform, which TED and the TEDx Mile High have done for me, as well as a number of other things that I've been involved with. And so when Simon & Schuster said that they were interested in my story and wanted me to write a memoir, uh, initially, I was a little resistant. I said, you know, wouldn't you really rather have a book on what I speak about most often, which is gender inequity? Because I do have that kind of unique perspective of having lived decades as a very successful, well-educated white man. And now, you know, I'm kind of discovering the other side, which is not, not nearly as easy as that was. And I had no idea before. I said, wouldn't you like that? And they said, actually, we would like some of that, but we need to hear your story. And it was cathartic to write the story. It was painful. It's been painful. I think I've done uh, 25 or 30 events already this month. And um, it is raw. It's a, it's a raw, open book. And you know, I found myself just struggling even to maintain my composure yesterday on Minnesota Public Radio. Um, because, you know, I think it's D.H. Lawrence, the writer said, a writer sheds his sickness in his writing. Oh, you don't beautiful. want to do that. You know, you, you really want to write your resolved issues. Mm -hmm. You want to write from your scars, not from your open wounds. And, you know, I've realized over the last month that, oh, yeah, there are still areas here that are not quite fully resolved yet. But, you know, it's not just a trans journey. It's not just a woman's journey. It is, you know, Joseph Campbell would call it the heroes or the heroine's journey. Mm -hmm. I think it's common to all of us. We get to that point where we realize that we're called onto the road of trials. And the major question of our life then is set before us. Do we accept that call or not? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, as you can already probably hear everybody who's listening, the reason why this book is so wonderfully written is because you actually are somebody who has been preaching. And so it just, the words are just so, and the concepts and the, um, the way you frame things are just so beautifully done and very, very right on point. And, and I, I want to, so thank you for that. Uh, talking about the difficulty, I think you also mentioned that you've done, you're going to do, you've done this in an audio, in an audible. So you're the one that had to read it out loud again. And I so, did. Yeah. And that was a little bit challenging, right? You know, I have never listened to an audio book. I oh. like to read books. I tend to read now on my phone. So I've entered that world, but I have never listened to an audio book. And so wow. reading my own was 
quite the journey. I had a wonderful engineer. He's done a lot with Simon and Schuster, over 3,000 books. And he was so helpful. And I realized in reading it that the audio book does, the human voice expresses so much more than is on the written page. You know, I had one of my church members say, I read the book, I cried, you know, three or four times. I uh, listened to the book and I cried like through the whole thing. Well, probably because I'm crying through the whole thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, Stephen, the engineer would say, just, just keep going, keep going. We'll figure out if we need to go back and do pickups later. And a fair amount of the time, we just let it go uh, because it was reliving a lot of the difficulty. The most difficult parts for me, almost exclusively, relate to my family, yes. to my former wife with whom I'm still close, to all three of my children, but particularly my son because of the relationship we had as father and son. And those always still, pretty much in every setting, will bring me to tears. Well, we'll get to that. I'll give you a break on that because I really do want to get into that subtitle, right? The, the subtitle here, which, uh, you know, really does talk about gender inequity in, in the patriarchy. And, um, you know, for me, this is a subject near and dear. As I, as a, the introduction had said, I do teach women's uh, health and studies at San Francisco State. So I did appreciate how forthcoming you were about owning your white male privilege. Uh, where entitlement is really built in uh, at birth to, to the stripping away of that as a woman. And, you know, had you been a, a woman of color, uh, even way more so. And so after you transitioned, you spoke about this new church you joined and uh, you wanted to set up this shared leadership structure. This really kind of really uh, spoke to me uh, in trying to collaborate with another female pastor and you hit upon the, the struggles and the epiphanies of what this really looked like. And I would, I, would, would you talk a little bit about that? Because You know, it's really interesting. Meaningful. Just last night, I was doing a corporate presentation to a number of CEOs in Singapore. And I was talking about the difference between men and women on just this subject. I said, I've had more conflict with women as a woman in seven years than I had with women as a man in 60 years. And I said, you know, men do, in fact, empower one another. I feel like the, that men come into a room, the first thing they do is identify who the alpha is in the room, and then they rank themselves accordingly. And then they set about accomplishing the purposes of the alpha, or, you know, an American sports analogy, they, they get in a huddle, they slap each other in the butt, and they advance the football and the quarterback down the field. Um, men empower one another. Women don't. Women see one another as competition. And that for me has been difficult to navigate because women are also very collaborative. Mm -hmm. So you got some paradoxical realities there. On one hand, you have this collaborative nature and my experience is that the majority of the women would prefer to work collaboratively. On the other hand, you have this competition. And I think I understand some of the reasons for it. 5.8% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women, 6.6% of Silicon Valley CEOs are women, 3% of venture capital goes to female founded firms. I mean, the numbers go on and on and on. So there truly is scarcity. It's easy for a woman to have a scarcity mentality because resources are scarce for women. But it's been interesting to me to see how um, how often women find themselves in competition with each other as opposed to empowering one another. Yes, and, and that experience that you had with uh, your um, fellow pastor ended up um, giving you some, some feedback, very honest feedback about how you show up. And it's very confusing because you are wanting to be that competent and uh, contributing person, but it wasn't working out to the point where you, you did move on. I did. Um, it was, uh, I, I stepped down and then um, shortly thereafter, she chose to step down and then the church came back to me and asked me to come back on staff. And I think we're in a far better place as a church now. And I still, this is a wonderful woman. She did so much for me in the five years that we were good friends and the two years that we worked together. But it was for me a sober awakening. You know, I have an alpha personality as an alpha male. 
I was never given any grief over that. As an alpha female, you know, you show a little bit of ambition and, oh, we're not supposed to show ambition. You speak up with confidence and control a room. Well, we're not supposed to do that. You think out loud. Yeah, we're not supposed to do that either. We're supposed to wait until we're called upon. And then we will speak succinctly and quickly because we know we're going to be interrupted anyway. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I've seen over and over statistics that show men interrupt women twice as often as they interrupt other oh, men. Yeah. And boy, now, I'm, now that I'm living that, I will often, when I see someone interrupt another woman, I'll say, excuse me, I don't believe she was done yet. I've also noticed you do that a couple of times and people finally stop interrupting. But you know, all of those things were natural to me mm -hmm. as a man. They're still natural to me as a woman, but they're not as well received. But I take some comfort. You know, if you look at um, Finland, Norway, Germany, Iceland, uh, Taiwan, and New Zealand, you know, what do they have in common? They, they did it amazingly well through the first phase of coronavirus. They also have a female head of state. And <laughs> every one of those women is an alpha personality. And when I look at those women, particularly I look at someone like uh, Jacinda Ardern or Angela Merkel, and they have those paradoxical strengths you often see with the strongest women of great confidence coupled with great humility. Mm. I think it's one of the things that allows those women to quickly correct themselves when they were headed down a path that wasn't working. Jacinda Ardern was amazing at this in New Zealand, really protected her nation. She didn't have any ego on the line. It's like, oh, well, that didn't work. We're going to shut, shut it down instead. You know, and you contrast all six of those nations with, oh, let's say, Brazil, um, the United States, and Great Britain. You know, I mean, you, you see the difference between strong women who have that great confidence coupled with great humility and strong men who, unfortunately, in those situations, had a weak ego structure. Yeah. Well said. No, that was really well said. And, uh, and, and these are these stories, you have so many great stories in your book. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned before, a memoir really uh, grabs our attention because, as I said, it's not not based on the wounds, but like how do we unravel those personal and professional hardships and go on against the odds and reemerge on the other side to a place of, of freedom and inner peace, which came came through in your uh, story. At, at huge cost as well. Um, and, you know, last week, Book Passage did a pride panel, and it was a group of astounding folks on it, um, including P. Carl, who wrote Becoming a Man. I don't know if you've heard yeah. of, yep. of him. And he said, as a trans person, I spent most of my life with my head in a book imagining other lives, other bodies, other histories. Sometimes it was a, to dream myself a cowboy on an open prairie, sometimes a priest giving other men hope of a God on the other side. I thought, oh, this is so, this is, I gotta bring this up to Paula, you know, cause your struggles felt so similar here and uh, the profound constraints and let's get to that of the evangelical world that you lived in from, well, from very early on within your family and in your community, but then took it on as your profession. and. I'd love for you to talk about your these this daily agony and contradictions of this conservative entwined doctrine that excluded LGBTQ people and women in general. You know, one of the problems with particularly the conservative forms of the desert religions, so all three desert religions that are still with us today, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, began as religions of scarcity, quite understandably, because they began in the desert. There's not enough resources around. We've got to take care of our own. In their more generous expressions, they've all moved beyond that. But if you look at their fundamentalist expressions, all three of them remain religions of scarcity. And to me, one of the most frightening things about all fundamentalism, wherever you find it, is goes back to what Edward O. Wilson, the sociobiologist at Harvard and MIT talks about. He says of the nine tribal species, species that have both what Richard Dawkins would call a selfish gene and a tribal gene, he says eight of them have behaved as they have evolved as you would expect. An enemy comes into the tribe, the tribe unites, defeats the enemy, life goes on. He said the ninth tribal species, he calls them eusocial species. He says has unfortunately evolved to believe that an enemy is necessary for the tribe to survive. So where no enemy exists, we create one. 
Wilson says we don't get a hold of that, we lose the species and probably lose the planet. And unfortunately, the most significant way in which we see that at play in the world is in fundamentalist religion, where consistently they create enemies that don't exist. I think part of that is fear. I think part of that is maintaining their power structures. If you think of Rene Girard's stuff about um, the mimetic theory, uh, you know, what better way to make sure you stay in power other than to find enemies within the camp that only I, from my position of power, can identify. And we see that so much right now with over 300 laws pending, fighting or taking away the rights of transgender children. I, I just a few minutes ago finished a, a White House event with Pete Buttigieg and um, uh, Rachel Levine, where we were talking about the importance of the Equality Act in, in today, given what's happening in all of those states. Not something that, that has to be dealt with in California or New York, where I lived for 35 years, or Colorado, where I live now. But in 30 states, this is an issue. Wow, we're up to 30 states, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, I, uh, I know that, uh, you know, the, the idea of, um, just this confusion for you in personally to get down to the, uh, you know, people want to know more about you, uh, and this really started, uh, with you at, um, I don't know, three or four years old, yeah. right? You know, you started, something was, you couldn't figure it out who could at three yeah. or four years old. And clearly you can rely on your family. Uh, you spoke, um, people really, uh, the parts of your book that were um, very um, heart-wrenching really was about your family. Uh, and, um, and it meant really going uh, along, get, go along to get along, right? Uh, you mm -hmm. know, in, especially in a community that just didn't have those structures or any narrative at all mm -hmm. around that. And then I wanna bring up, you met Kathy. Oh, uh, and she just, uh, you know, sort of gave you a, a sort of an out, a pathway, uh, you know, a reprieve, if you will. Um, and uh, I just want to tell you, reading about her, uh, she's like a saint <laughs> of an ally and a person and a human being. And I stopped reading so I could look her up. I wanted to see her face. I wanted to get to know who this person was. And uh, you know, and I kept wondering when the shoe would drop, you know what I mean? Like how, what kind of struggle she was going through. And I was wondering if you can give us a little bit more texture to her and her emotion and her help for you. Cause I know your marriage dissolved but your relationship is so strong. Right, we are both, uh, we're both psychotherapists. Uh, my doctorate's in pastoral counseling and we are still in business together. We have an office here at, at the house that we once lived in together. So I see her a couple of days a week. Um, it was very, very difficult for her. I felt like it was important that I not tell her story, that I tell my story. My son wrote a wonderful book, She's My Dad, that is his story about what it was like as a child to deal with a parent coming out where it had never been known anywhere throughout uh, life. And it, Kathy struggled greatly with it. She continues to struggle greatly mm. with it. Uh, I had a big giant birthday um, last month and so our entire family, including Kathy, went to Hawaii for a week. And I asked her before we left, I said, can you go? Um, will it be all right for you? And we have all of our granddaughters, all five of them coming uh, this Sunday. And we'll be together again for about another um, three weeks. And same thing, I said, are you gonna be okay? Because we don't have to do the grandparenting thing together because it is difficult for her. She would like to be in a relationship with someone else, she's not. Mm -hmm. And if you checked her out and looked, <laughs> looked her up, she's a beautiful woman. And she certainly is. It, you know, we would still be together if it, if I wasn't trans, I mean, we had like the world's best marriage therapist. Mike Solomon was his name, the perfect name. And he was, I don't know, 110, you know, and he's, he's retiring <laughs> and we're his last clients on his last day. And, you know, we're both therapists. And I just said, I said, Mike, how many couples are willing to work this hard? And I mean, he didn't hesitate. He said, yeah, 1%. And I said, whoa, okay. How many couples get as far as we have in working through their stuff? And he said, 1%. 
And okay. And then he's the one who said, which is what makes this so tragic because you're a lesbian and Kathy's not. And that was the point. It was like, oh God, you're right. It's like a two hour drive down to where his office was on the south side of Denver. We drove home in utter silence. Wow. Because I think we both knew it was over. Mm. And I was not public yet. I had not lost my job yet. Um, I was kind of in a year where I was living part-time as Paul, part-time as Paula. Uh, but that was the point at which we realized, oh God, yeah, it's just as important for her to be true to who she is as it is for mm. me to be true to who I, I am. Yeah. So it is, uh, it's not been, not been easy for her. She's been very gracious and a wonderful towering strength to me. Yeah, that is just so, so great to hear. I, I have a whole bunch of other questions here, but I see we've got some in the chat. So we'll, st we'll, we'll bring in uh, some of the audience here. Um, Lou Judson asks, uh, how is it that you only realized who you really were at 60? It must have been hard to come to that realization in the religious environment. In the in the religious environment, I knew it at three or four, and I know yeah. the age because we moved out of that house when I was four. But you know, I'm older than dirt, so I mean, this is the 1950s, <laughs> and nobody knows anything about what it means. I mean, there was that one single person on earth. It was Christine Jorgensen, who was a public trans figure, and I remember rushing home from high school to watch her on Merv Griffin, and it was a gift to me. There were no books until the 1970s when Jan Morris wrote the wonderful book Conundrum, which is probably still, I think, maybe one of the best books on the trans experience. And that was when I first began to realize, oh, this is bigger than I thought and going to be more of an issue than I thought. I did not tell Kathy about it until after we married, and I talk about that in the book. That was such a mistake. But in my evangelical naivete, I thought that marriage was going to fix it. And had I known that it wasn't, I certainly would have told her before we married. And of course, then the question is, would we have married? Uh, again, that was 1972. So how much really did we know or could have been known at that point about it? Certainly knowing what we know today, we would not have chosen to marry. But neither one of us would go back and change it. We, I love my, my time with the kids at home. I love being a dad to them. And we look at it and realize that, um, I don't say this very often. Uh, in fact, I don't know that I've said this publicly, but we both have said, we had 25 years of great marriage. And then we had 15 where it was tough because the inevitable was beginning to peek through the front door we were beginning to see that it was at least possible where this might lead. And so those, those years got progressively more difficult until she, as well as I, finally realized that we were not going to be able to remain married. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I do say that you're... Um, you know, you mentioned about your therapist, they were so supportive and, and you were able to talk uh, about, um, you know, get the encouragement because the, the question is really why at 60? Well, it takes a, you know, it was before that, but it take, took a while for you to really make that transition, but you were transitioning. You were, you did start uh, the hormonal treatments and you also did some, you know, some facial surgery and, um, you know, you were exploring that. And I, I like the part of the book where your therapist said, uh, you know, you asked very candidly, do you think a six foot two person, you know, can, can pass? And I think it was the she, not Mike, the other woman, uh, the woman had said, um, no, <laughs> but who cares, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, it, and it really yeah. shifted. I think, I think there was a lot of a, sh a shift there for you where you, know, you were going, well, I, it seemed like you. Yeah, you know, I cared greatly. Um, because I knew that I'm just not wired to be the kind of person who's going to be stared at or made fun of in public. And mm -hmm. I, some people have a, a greater ego strength in that realm. I don't. And one of the biggest causes of post-transition suicidal ideation is internalized transphobia. 
And mm -hmm. I knew that if I did not uh, appear in public as a cisgender woman, my life is going to be so much more difficult. And that has, in fact, been a blessing. I think it's much easier, in fact, for me to give, be a very public trans figure because, you know, when I'm flying on an airplane or, or stopping at, at the gas station or in a restaurant, nobody seems to have any idea that I'm trans. Mm -hmm. And that does, in fact, make my life much easier. It also causes me to experience a lot more that cisgender uh, experience of, uh, you know, realizing that women start a lot further away from the finish line than men do. Oh boy, understatement. Yeah, uh, yeah, very much so. Um, no, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go back to a couple of questions here. From your unique perspective, do you have? This is from Sharon. Do you have advice for alpha women, but, all, but also want to collaborate? It seems from my experience that people think you're up to something. Oh, I like that. Cause yeah, I feel like that's exactly what happens with a certain kind of person. I mean, we do tend to project onto others our own way of operating. So when I see someone who thinks that I think, oh, okay, well that's instructive to me. But I see it a lot more from women than I saw with men. It was interesting last night talking to all these CEOs in Singapore. So female CEOs, about half, it was about half and half. But listening to the women talk, I, after I was done talking, we went into our groups and, and I kind of stepped into each one of the groups. And that was the biggest theme that kept coming up from the women was how they have themselves, and these are all CEOs under 50, how they all just came to that point in their life when they said, yeah, I don't care if I'm called the B word, I, I've got to go for this. And then interestingly, several of them said that the biggest support in that was their parents, particularly their father, and particularly their fathers when they were adults. Huh. And I thought back to my own girls when they were in their 20s and they went into ministry, kind of everybody ended up going into the family business and they were extremely successful in very large churches and then very quickly realized the incredible misogyny that exists in evangelicalism. And I was very active in saying to them, yeah, you don't have to deal with this. Um, you know, there's a better world out there for you. And you, you know, don't let them pay you less than they're paying guys doing the same work. It just, and you know, listening to these CEOs, it's like, oh, the father can play a very important role to the daughter, even well into her adult years in giving her the confidence to say, hey, you can play with the boys, just do it. Just yeah. find the ego strength to let them call you whatever they want to call you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, I mean, one of the problems is we teach our daughters, they have to be perfect. And I mean, that works fine to them when they're in school, but then, you know, they get out into the real world and a position opens up in the company. It's got five requirements. A woman has four of the five and she's like, oh, I can't apply. I don't have the chance. <laughs> you know, and we teach our sons to be confident. A guy sees the same five requirements. He's got two of the five and he says, yeah, I got this. You know, I mean, he applies, he gets the job and he's half as qualified as the woman. Oh, you know, so I, we well got to stop teaching our daughters to be perfect and teach them instead to be persistent. But to do that, they're going to have to have a thick skin. And so much of that is kind of endemic to our personality, into the core of who we are. Mm -hmm. Some personality types will have a far lesser difficulty um, being able to, to be called the B word than others. It's not something that every woman is going to have the capacity to do, no matter how much ego strength she has. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, um, I have a question similar to... Um... Uh, to Laura, uh, Lori Friedman, who says, having both male and now female perspectives, what are the main differences? How it feels, how you've treated, been treated in the world, what you've experienced. You touched a little bit about that earlier in our conversation, but um, probably have a lot more to say. <laughs> yeah, I think the absolute most frustrating thing is not being judged on the aggregate body of your work. Mm -hmm. I've always been a Renaissance person. I've worked in a number of different fields. I was in a meeting uh, six months ago where they were discussing new entrepreneurial ventures and hiring CEOs for new entrepreneurial ventures. And two or three times I attempted to offer some suggestions and was 
interrupted by men every single time. And finally, one of the men who knows me well said, you know, we could ask the only person in this room who's written a book on that subject, uh, who should be hired as a CEO for an entrepreneurial venture that needs to grow fast to survive. Um, because we, I think we only have one person in the room who's actually written the book about that. And the people are like, oh, okay. And then he gave the platform to me and I was so grateful because to everybody else in that room, the only reason I was in that particular room was because I, I used to teach a doctoral course, Current Trends in American Religion. And so in their mind, well, yeah, I, I was there because I'm that person who, who knows what's going on religiously in America. And so if questions specifically about religion come up, well, we'll ask her opinion. You know, I mean, that's not the way it is. I, I was on the board of an organization and we hired a new CEO talking about having her speak for a conference that we run. And I said, yeah, she's not a seasoned speaker. It might be better if we interview her, but if you want her to speak, I'll be happy to coach her. Powerful white man in the room, McKinsey partner, as a matter of fact, huh. um, said, well, if we're gonna do that, why don't we hire a real coach? I mean, I, I was just beside myself. I didn't speak up. I, there were plenty of people there who knew. I know what I wanted to say. I wanted to say, I've done four TED Talks. I've coached TEDx speakers. I'm a speaker's ambassador for TED. I've taught speech in three universities, two in the US and one in Europe. What part of that doesn't make me a real coach? But <laughs> instead mad. I didn't say anything in that setting because I, I didn't really have the, um, I did not have the platform in that setting. I did not have the respect in that setting to speak up that boldly. Yeah, it is it's infuriating. Oh, is it uh, utterly and infuriating? To, and not to mention the 40 years of speaking in front of large yeah. groups of people. So, yeah. I mean, and that and that's one of the things I, I'm going to um, weave in uh, Sharon's question as well. Um, but that, you know, really um, getting back into the church and the leadership and women and not being heard, you know, I guess for me, the one of the most distressing times of your transitions is the church's reaction. Uh, you know, it really wasn't surprising to hear that they cut you off, you know, socially, financially. Um, you know, you spoke, you spoke about this betrayal and it was really dark days. I, I, um, I know you manage with um, good lawyers to get, you know, the finances back that you earned and that were, um, uh, were deservedly given, should have come to you. But those decades were brutal. And I know now you're settled into this new church and you've moved on, but um, are you getting any backlash? I mean, is there backlash or, um, you know, now your book is, your book is out and all the publicity you've done for the last couple of years, how is the evangelical leadership and the community are like, stop talking, Paula, you know, you're, oh, you're out yeah. of They're not particularly happy, but I've learned to protect myself from that world. You know, I think uh, there are 16, 17,000 comments on my first TED talk. You don't want to read them. Um, you know, that world's going to do what that world's going to do. And so every time I was on 1A, which is one of my favorite NPR shows a couple of weeks ago, and that one really brought a lot of them out. Good Morning America really brought a lot of them out. And, you know, they find ways to find me. And um, once I, uh, after a New York Times article four years ago, someone showed up at my door. That was scary. Um, Always somebody will find my phone number and, and call. Most often it will, interestingly, it's still letters, through the mail letters, but people will make comments on my website or, yeah, they're not happy. Um, there aren't a lot of well-known evangelical leaders who transition. Well, I don't know any evangelical leaders who are well-known who've transitioned. And so uh, that world, done much care for me. And interestingly, when I transitioned, I lost not one single non-evangelical friend. The evangelical world, I knew, I don't know, five, 10,000 people by name. And I've heard nicely from like 50. And I've met, I think, 18. And I've met four more than once. Um, now, interestingly, since the book came out, I, I like I got a wonderful... Um, email this morning from one of my former students in a doctoral program thanking me for my journey. And one of my own mentors 
has done the same and just sent me a, a book that he's ready to take to a publisher wanted my opinion on it. And, you know, nobody's giving him any kudos for being in touch with me. So there are exceptions, mm -hmm. but they're the exception that proves the rule. That world, well, I mean, as you can see from just the laws being passed right now, right now the trans population is their target. Mm -hmm. They lost at the Supreme Court on the level of marriage equality. So they picked on trans people and then particularly trans kids, because why not? they only have a 13 times higher suicide rate than their peers. We'll pick on them. Don't get me started. Yeah, no, that's a question. No, but I'll tell you, that's what uh, Sharon is asking. And can you suggest how we might help in fighting the trans hate laws that are cropping up all over the country? And that what I was going to say too, how can we, how can we go ahead and, you know, sort of preach the gospel, so to speak, uh, supporting you know, your, you know, your ministry around this and to, you know, counterpoint for this dangerous spread of hate and exclusion. Yeah, I, I think calling it out um, for what it is. Um, if we take a look at what, what's happening with these laws, it's really fascinating because a study was done of Trump voters in the 10 swing states. Mm. Asked the question, should transgender people have the same civil rights as everyone else? 60% said yes. 70% hmm. of all Americans are supportive of the Equality Act. Interesting. So who then is in opposition to trans people? We're now up to 300 bills pending and over 20 sitting on, on governor's desks waiting for signatures, nine that have been passed into law. And, you know, it's like, okay, so who's behind all this if it's not necessarily Trump voters? It's evangelical Christians. 84% of whom believe that gender is immutably determined at birth. 61% of whom believe that we've already given transgender people too many civil rights. And yet only 25% of whom actually know someone uh, or are aware that they know someone who is transgender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, I it, think it is true. We can, I think calling those people out, um, th they're... They listen, and I think calling them out is something that allies can do. Uh, easier for an ally to do than it is for me to do that. Yeah. To say, what is wrong with the religious right in America to be creating these enemies among very, very vulnerable children? Yeah, no, and it's children. So it's yes, kids. you would think you would think there was would be more compassion and sensitivity yeah. around it, but uh, it's like you know, pick it's... on me. I mean, I had all these <laughs> decades of male entitlement. I'll not live long enough to lose it. I, I can handle your your attacks. Pick on me. Mm -hmm. No, they pick on the kids. Yeah, no, it's true. And in fact, uh, you know, going along with that, uh, Jeffrey G. S. My friends and I are afraid of evangel evangelicals. After decades of, uh, of listening to what sounded like attacks from them, is there anything you can say to make it comfortable for us to trust them at all? Yeah, I just uh, met with uh, a good friend last night who's head of faith-based initiatives for the Biden White House, Josh Dixon. And he said, I don't know if you've seen this number yet, but 56% uh, of millennial evangelicals voted for Biden. Wow. Yeah, 76% of evangelicals voted for Trump, but that was down from 81% four years ago. Where was that 5% difference? Evangelical women. Mm. And they targeted evangelical women, uh, particularly in the swing states, um, because they knew that they were not going to tolerate the way things were. But if you take a look at the millennials or Gen Z, they're long over this issue. It's just the boomers and Gen X among evangelicals yeah. and their power is gonna be gone before too long. You know, the problem is kids are dying in the meantime. I mean, this is a last gasp. The ship's already sailed, there's no question. Mm -hmm. And I think we can hurry it up, but um, you know, wh when your back is against the wall, that's when you fight the most. So I understand the fear, mm -hmm. but um, you know, their, their days are numbered. I, I think it's it's not a problem. I, I mean, I, the best way to deal with them is not to scream at them from across the street 
it's to sit yeah. in the front porch and tell stories. It's why I wrote this book. Yeah. It's why I'll go to Christian universities and speak. Uh, because if you meet me, you know, you're kind of going to have to realize I'm a relatively normal human, roughly as normal or abnormal as you are. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, if I can create that, that, um, that sense of, of um, it, wait, wait, this doesn't fit with what I thought I understood. Uh-huh. Yeah, that, that's all I need to do. Yeah. And we do that by sharing our stories. We're a narrative-based species. I, you know, it's, it's not logical arguments that change anybody's mind. It's, it's stories. And yet I'm really instructed by one of my favorite uh, books on cultures, Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind. And he says, people do change their minds, but not unless information comes to them in a non-threatening way. That's right. And it's one of the reasons I think story is such a good idea. I just signed a deal with a Hollywood company to do a seven to 10 part um, television series, a uh, limited series based on my life. And the reason for that is because Pose has certainly done a lot of good for the trans community, just like the L word has for the, the lesbian community. And I... I want us to do well-told stories. I was going to just say that to everybody. If you didn't know, she's got this limited series, at Cannonball. Yeah, That's so Cannonball. so exciting. Very, very thrilling. Uh, yeah, we have our first meeting on July 6th. So next, oh, that is, uh, next, next Tuesday. Week. Next yeah. week. Uh, yeah, and I, I just, um, I, th that's going to really, you're right. You are the spokesperson. We need to tell our stories. And that leads us to the last, que this question uh, here we have. Um, from Sharon again, because it, I, I did want to bring this up about, you know, what you call it post-evangelical uh, mm -hmm. teaching now. And then you're this new church, I think it's called Left. Um, left Hand, right. Left we hand, have a canyon and, uh, and a creek in, in Boulder County that's called Left Hand, also a brewery. Um, <laughs> and so we wanted to be identified as a as a countywide church. So that's why we chose the name Left Hand Church. Well, I love the, um, I love the, uh, the icon as well you know the um yeah uh, yeah it's really cool but now sharon said if it's not too personal can you share what church you belong to now and that's the one um and she says my son is gender queer and we need a new accepting church home so yeah, i we thought are, this was great there are a lot of us working hard to create um post-evangelical churches and what defines that is the style of the church is still like uh, evangelical churches. So you have very contemporary worship, you have excellent children's programming, uh, you have very practical messages, but you don't have that conservative evangelical theology. And there are a lot of those churches. Uh, city Church San Francisco, I, I've preached there, that, that is a wonderful church in, in the city um, that, uh, you know, there, it, there's at least one in every major city, but Fred Harrell's their lead pastor. I, I love that church. Yeah, good. Well, that's great because uh, there's. I hope Sharon, you took that down because uh, yeah. that was um, that's a it's a good lead because obviously we can't we don't yeah. know how far you're planting your your left hand church to other places. So yeah. uh, I see. I learned the word planting ministry through your. I know. Your book. Yeah, that yeah. that kind of came. Yeah, that that started in I the eighties. Yeah, that, I know. Uh, they, I didn't. Yeah. I go. Well, what are they talking about? What is she talking about here? I had to look that yeah. up too. And, explain it to me but um but i i will say that um one of the so many beautiful things about your book especially i i know we're coming at, end to, in, at the end of the hour but um i do you know also I'm really moved by um you know the, the discussion of paul and that life and the the transition to uh you know this new relationship that you have and i know that um that process, I think they, you know, it's called dead named, you mentioned in there that you don't, that's, well, that's there. Yeah. And I just love the, and I, if people don't have, uh, you know, hopefully after this, you get the book, of course, uh, but also go and check the, um, the TED talk with your son. That was uh, yeah. chills down the spine. I mean, really so moving. And so what, what he, your family went through and how they've come to the other side in such a beautiful way. And uh, yeah, it was, yeah, definitely, you know, Thank tears. You. So uh, I, and, and that yeah. goes into that explanation that um, I hope people will look at. And I, <clears throat> I do want to say that um, this, you, you make the distinction in the book at the very end between, you know, happiness and joy. Mm -hmm. And 
I I would love for you to just talk a little bit about how, you know, the happy yeah. points and now happy expected joy is yeah, fear makes us want to go, makes us want to go back. Happiness makes us want to stand still. And the happiness comes pretty much when you expect it. You know, you start vacation in Hawaii, you're happy. You, you get a bigger tax refund than you expected, you're happy. But joy has a mind of its own. Joy is a deep sense that you're at one with your place in the universe. You know, it, it makes me think of, um, of Mary Oliver's poem, The Journey, you know. Uh, one day you knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their mad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried, mend my life, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough, and a wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, a new voice, a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own. It kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. Mary Oliver knew what joy was. Oh, what a beautiful way to, everybody hear that? What a beautiful way to end this hour with this uh, very inspiring poem from a very, very inspiring, amazing woman. Thank you, Reverend Paula, and for stopping by and talking to us and I'm going to let Nick talk a little bit more about it but this is great uh great book great read get to know her more and uh thank you for letting me have this opportunity as a privilege well thank you so much Kathy it's been delightful talking with you and thank you to the both of you for coming one last time from book passage this, it was absolutely a wonderful conversation thanks that was that was really really great uh, and thanks to everybody that was in the chat asking questions or just had comments or, or uh, things in that regard. Um, there were even a couple of questions we didn't get to. I'm, I, I apologize. Uh, it was a lot more than we we uh, normally get. But So I'm, I'm glad that you asked them. I hope that the questions that everybody did get to, um, that, that you found them to be useful uh, and that you enjoyed it. The book is As a Woman. You can buy it from bookpassage.com. We'll ship it right to your house, even if you don't live in the Bay Area. We, we do that just like every other online book retailer. Um, you can either buy it by clicking the blue link at the very top of the chat or by clicking the post that I just put into the chat or you can go to bookpassage.com and buy the book there. Pretty straightforward. Um, additionally, I, uh, you know, uh, whoa, 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 where is the thing? There you go. Uh, the other, uh, our, our uh, moderator's book today is called Ripple Effect. You can buy it also from Book Passage. It's very, uh, we're very, very happy to, and blessed to have such amazing moderators that come through here and uh, Kathy has been no exception. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you. And thank you one last time for coming out, for supporting independent bookstores, not even just not ours, and independent bookstores in your area, independent churches in your area that are supportive of the things which you believe and supportive of the things which create a better future for all of us, including the kids. <laughs> so thank you one last time for coming out. I do truthfully hope to see you in the next one. Bye, everybody.